Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on another session of We Connect Academy, learning from women leaders around the world series. My name is Andrea, and today I am very happy to introduce Nguana Matloa. She is the co-founder and CEO of Abel Technologies, a certified company based in South Africa. She brings more than 13 years of experience in the industry of technology, and she is going to share about her experience with data management and how you can make it work in favor of your company's profit. I'll let Juana introduce herself, but I would like to remind all the attendees that you are in listen-only mode. So if you have any questions, please write them down in the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right hand of the screen. Do as many questions as possible. I will make sure to read them out loud once the webinar is completed. The recording of this webinar will be also available after today's session and it will be emailed to all the attendees and it will also be available on our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do it by looking for We Connect International on YouTube. Thank you so much for being here with us, Nwana. Over to you. Hi, Andrea. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's joining from everywhere in the world. I just got wind that there's some from US, some from India. And I know there's fellow colleagues here from South Africa. So unfortunately, because of the network, I'm going to have to switch off my camera. but please ask as many questions as you can. And it's a bit weird giving a webinar or a topic like this without it being interactive because I love the face-to-face -face or being able to see who I'm talking to. So I do hope that I impart great knowledge and help you see how data isn't a new concept, it's not a boring concept, and what action and value it can bring into your organization, no matter the size. So don't feel overwhelmed if you are an SME thinking, I don't have the tools, so how am I going to manage? So I'll get started right away. So the topic is making sense and sense of data, because at the end of the day, many of the time we're inundated with lots of information, whether it's social media, the news, anywhere and we don't know how to determine what is important what is not then we still have to worry about fake news and all of that but what we also want to do with data is how do you monetize it and many a times people have heard this term but it's like very foreign for them so it's about how do you get the data and make sense of it in terms of cleaning it up using it to take action thus it either leads to increase in sales or decrease in expenses and, and so forth. So before I start, this is not going to be a technical topic. So anyone who is in the league of Dr. Fukosi or Dr. Tabisa, these are data scientists. This is nothing at that level. So please feel free, you, you don't have to stay for long, but I have not pitched this at that level. So we're not going to be talking about algorithms and AI and all the new terms. So if you're a beginner and you're a business owner who just wants to know how do I use data to take action, this is in the session for you. I hope no one has left. Okay. So the object objective is for to provide an understanding of data, where it starts from, what is data management, and then we come back to how do we then use data. So before I carry on, just a brief, a brief background on myself. I have been in business for more than 10, 12 years or so, can't remember and i'm an adventurer i love action sports i love trail running i've done three comrades marathons so i'm really bummed that because of COVID, there won't be comrades marathon this weekend and all those if any one of you was going to run comrades i my heart goes out to you i've been married for three years to my husband but we've known each other for almost 20 years actually and 
I love sports and my favorite TV show just happens to be The Big Bang Theory with Sheldon being my favorite character. And I'm a very spiritual person. And where it all started for me with regards to big data was when I had the opportunity to go work in Disney Interactive. And there it was in 2013. So understanding what big data was and the difference between that and business intelligence was key for me. I was hearing this buzzword like, okay, what is big data? What is it supposed to do? And as you know, in South Africa, we're still a bit behind with regards to uh, Tel Aviv in Israel or Silicon Valley in the US with regards to technology in some instances, not all instances. So when I went over there, I had the privilege of being placed in the business intelligence division and working with Kalika, who you see there on, I think your left, my right. And she heads up the business intelligence unit as the vice president. So having spent time there at Disney Interactive, it provided me with a foundation because as much as my background started off in software development and understanding what cubes are, what data warehouses are, now what the step between that and big data is very vast. And also the insights and the actions that you can get from big data was very astonishing and quite interesting for me. So at Disney Interactive, because they have uh, products such as Star Wars, such as Marvel, to name a few. It was very nice to be able to see how Disney uses their data from product design all the way up until the product is in the market, whether it's on your Facebook or it's on your PS2 or your Xbox or it's on the website. So I got to a chance to sit with the designers. They were doing the Star Wars animation that was quite cool. And then went through the entire process where you're now seeing the games as now they're in production, they're at sales. There's products such as your figurines for Pirates of the Caribbean, the Incredibles. And then you get to see how the data engineers are getting that data from the various sources and they're doing A-B testing. So testing different scenarios say, okay, if on this game at this level, how much changes can we make? Are the users liking the stage that they are? What weapons do we need to use? Which parts or tokens do we sell? Which ones do we give for free? So all that information, now the changes can happen at a rapid pace. You don't have to wait up until next week or even tomorrow to make changes. Some changes were even done in production. And of course, those were the minor changes. Major changes were scheduled accordingly, but it was still much faster than what we're used to where you have to send information, sit on a cab or change approval board, so much paperwork. So what data or big data and how it was used at Disney Interactive was quite insightful and something I know and knew back then that it's something I need to implement not only within our technology, but also at our clients. So. I work for Abbott Technology. We are very client-centric and data-focused. And how we work, we build our products with regards to data. So whether it's websites or automation, business process optimization, user experience design, all of those have their basis on data. And there is my business partner, Paso Mukoni. We met each other at Varsity, and he's a tech extraordinaire, so hopefully one day he'll be able to give a talk. So, as I was saying, we build our information or our platforms and deliver solutions based on data, and one of our mottos was, we follow the data. And that is something that all organizations need to be doing, following the data. And if we did that more often, we would, some of the changes, like for example, companies such as Kodak, if they had listened to their customers or looked at trends, seeing where the sales are, they would have been around. Phones such as, or products such as Blackberry, they would have also been around. 
So data helps you avoid pitfalls and make decisions sooner rather than later. It helps you see which products are not worth having anymore in my product catalog. So a brief history of data. And I'm not talking about commander data from Star Wars or Star Trek, uh, although he does kind of fit in because he was also an android and he was part of, uh, or rather built for AI. So, but in this case, I'm not talking with regards to commander data. I hope I appeal to some of the Star Trek fans. The history of data or the roots of big data goes all the way back to 2000 BC. I know some of you might be shocked as to, geez, we only thought it was probably around the 1900s when we got the digital computers and so forth, but no. Data has been around for the longest of time. And sometimes I laugh when I hear people saying data is the new oil or data is the new gold. But then as I'm, I think to myself, how have we been making decisions even before we had computers? I mean, historically, information from the Bushmen or the Khoisan was captured uh, in the cave paintings. That's how they were making decisions. The Ishango bone from Uganda, or some were calling it the telestick, that's used for arithmetic. So data has always been around, just in a different format. And as you can see, oh, sorry, my slides have kind of moved a bit. It's only in 1959 or in 1958 where we only start seeing the emergence of business intelligence and machine learning. And then we have 1940s where the start of the digital computers. So data has been around. The only difference is we just didn't know how to take the right ac or actions or insights from it or how to process it accordingly. But we've always been making decisions. And I got, uh, if you have time to go online, you'll be able to see the whole timeline that outlines how data started and the various uh, sources of it. And I got this from the Wolfram website. I'll share the reference with you. So once again, I do say, and I could be taken to task for this, data for me is not the new oil, is not the new gold because it's been around for the longest. It's how now we have advanced in technology that we're able to make decisions much faster. In some cases, uh, we are able to make decisions faster and we are able to now advance into different technologies such as AI and machine learning. So when, like I was saying, when people saying data is the new oil, it feels like, does it mean if people are blind or rather if people wear sunglasses, they're blind? I don't think so. That's because you weren't seeing the data in your organization or making use of the data in your organization. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. We've always been having the data, whether it's on paper or in an Excel format. So we'll get down to the data and what we want to do with it. So what is important with regards to data and data management is why do we want to have this information? Why are we spending so much money? Why is there a big hoo-ha with regards, especially now with fourth industrial revolution with regards to, oh, data this, data that, there's IoT that is being now the talk of the town, but it helps us increase our profits, whether in sales, it helps us change our marketing strategy, see which clients we need to start targeting, how to increase our productivity, how do we restructure products and our services? How do we venture into new markets? Whether it's, if you're in Johannesburg, do you want to now provide services in Cape Town? Or do I want to now provide services in Botswana? Now COVID has happened. Having data allows you to re-strategize and see where else can I go and offer my services and products or what products and service does no longer serve me in this point in time. As you are aware, many people are now going on the online space and 
how does that now affect those that used to have a brick and mortar setup? But also what is important that is now becoming more important is like uh, what they call doing business for good is the social impact that data allows us to have. So companies or organizations such as the UN with their sustainable development goals, they use data to find out where, which areas around the world they can have an impact, which areas, for instance, are, is education a problem? Where is women empowerment not happening? So with that information, it allows them to provide the right solution so they can see, oh, there's malnutrition in this area of Africa or perhaps in India. How, what is the status with regards to education? How do we decrease the empowerment, I mean, the unemployment gap, especially for youth? That is very much important in South Africa. If we don't have the data, then it's a problem. With COVID, it allows the scientists to be able to track where the patients are, who have they been in contact with, how high or how fast is our rate uh, of infections increasing? Where are the hotspots? And whether, does, whether lockdown needs to increase or not? So data is very vital in whichever sense you look at it. But most importantly, besides getting it, who is it all about? And that's what I learned when I was in Disney. It's about the customer. They are at the center of your data journey, whether it's a B2B, meaning you're providing service to another business, whether it's a corporate or SME, or you're providing it to a consumer, or it's a B2B to C. So you could be providing other technology services to a corporate who then provides services to individual consumers. It's all about them, your suppliers. They, to them, you are a customer. So they need to know how they can service you better. How much have you been buying from them so that they can improve their service offering to you? So data management is in high level terms of what the dictionary definition says. It's the practice of managing data as a valuable resource to unlock its potential for an organization. So how do you manage this valuable resource to unlock potential for yourself? So how do you get that data? How do you store that data? And how will it then help you make informed decision? Of course, it's not as simple as merely just gathering it, storing it, and then saying, oh, okay, this is what my Excel spreadsheet is telling me. It, in some cases, it will require to be cleaned so that if there's any duplicates or there's missing information, you can fix that. But you need to have a plan as to how you go about that entire process. Who has access to the data? Because you do not want people in your organization making changes to the database or the master data, which we'll cover later on. So if we understand data management, that whether you're a corporate or an SME, it does apply to you. Yes, as a small business, you might not have the tools or even the budget to execute at what an EY or a standard bank or WeConnect International can execute at, but you can still have the tools such as Excel, and others for you to be able to implement data management as well as data management strategies. So here's some of the terminology that I come across on a daily basis, and I know some of you do come across that, such as big data, Python, small data, machine learning, and this is still a small portion as to what big data or rather with regards to the data terminology that we get and who knows probably as we're sitting here right now there's a new term that's coming up with regards to data and i know with technology i'm not sure about other industries we like creating new terms you know we i think we like feeling smart and so we just create new terms as we feel like it but if you you don't have to feel 
overwhelmed by the amount of terminologies that are coming out and some of them might not apply to you but if you just get to know the most important was like what is big data data security ai and machine learning and those then it, it it allows you to have conversations and to know how to then apply it into your environment so with regards to the data management framework I'll, i'm going to take you through the framework and then we'll go get into how does now the framework apply to an organization so we need to look at the architecture and the data sorry the data management um, framework is like your strategy but you cannot have a data management strategy or any technology strategy if you as a company have not outlined your business strategy it is important to understand that technology needs to support the business and not the other way around so starting with your data architect this represents the data that is stored how is it going to be stored and examples of that would be your customer data your supplier data and if you look at if you think of your architect or architecture it's like your house plans where does each room go where so now you need to understand what type of information am i going to be storing is it supplier data customer data in some cases it's employee data as well and then you need to have people who are going to govern or rather yes for lack of a better word govern or approve this architecture just like when you are building a house once you have your architectural plans designed you take it to the municipality in the south african context for it to get approved and then the next thing as part of the data management is your database systems or that is how or the design of how your data is going to look like for example is it an unstructured database or is it a structured database so things like microsoft sql server those are relational databases mongodb those are unstructured databases so there it allows you to uh, mongodb allows you to get data from various sources so for you it would be or as an sme or small business it would be like an excel that would be an example of unstructured data because and with relational databases what we're looking at is what is the relationship between my information so for example your customer information with regards to the products or the orders that they have placed next thing we need to look at the data modeling and the design and how that sorry the data model and the design and as i was saying it refers to the relationship as how it all fits together because when you're at the point now we are running your reports you're running your queries you're doing your analysis the information needs to be related or rather linked and this is once the cleanup has happened so we're looking at if i want to find out how much shoes this particular customer has bought how do i know that if i have not done the proper modeling if i want to find out which supplier is giving me better prices with regards to hardware that i'm buying i need to have made sure that that relationship is built in there so we have different types of database models and these are erd or your entity relationship diagram and that's where the link comes in so if you look at the diagram that has the just underneath the database system design that is the one with regards that refers to entity relationship diagram and then the one at the bottom that is your graph data model as you can see it's much more easier to comprehend and so those that are more on the business side of the business and not the technology side they would prefer the graph data model so that they can understand the relationship of their data And the next one, which is very important, is your meta metadata and your master data. This talks about how is 
your data or rather it describes your data. So as highlighted, your metadata provides more information. It, if you think about it in English, it's your describing words, your adjectives, so to speak. And there you can feel such as first name, surname, gender. So any attribute that you want to know with regards to your customer. And then your master data, that has your critical information. And that could be customer information, your provinces, your countries. And this information is, needs to be kept very clean because you do not want to have different people updating your metadata as well as your master data. It's important that during the discussion of your data management framework, you are thinking who's going to be in charge whenever we get a new customer, whenever we get a new, um, let's say you didn't have suppliers, now you're adding a supplier form or now you're adding products to a service business. Who is going to manage the products? Who's going to manage that information? And it's also important that this task of creating metadata and master data, it's not only for the IT, because I know in many organizations, IT can be left to run and do as they please, but that is dangerous. It needs to be a collaborative effort between the business as well as the IT divisions. And it's, it's important that the business leaders or rather the heads of departments are also educated with regards to what is happening on their data so that they don't rely a lot on their IT teams all the time. What is also important is your data quality. This is about how accurate your data is. As you know, garbage in, garbage out. So is your data accurate? Is your data complete? How many times have you, if you have a, an installment, you go to, let's say, Macro or Edgar's or any store, store, for instance, and you want to get your statement, but it's not fully updated. Now, this is the frustration that on a large scale that lack of data quality creates. So you need to ensure that whatever data or how it is stored, it is reliable. If you're getting data from another system into your system, you need to ensure that you maintain the data quality or integrity of that data. So for example, you see in some cases, different formats. And in some cases as well, where you are working with an international client, how do they store their dates? So uh, obvious example would be one between America as well as South Africa. Now in South Africa, we have the first format uh, where it's the DDMM, Y, eight month in the year. And then the US has the month date in the year. So it can be confusing, especially when you're looking at dates that are less than 30 then it's easy to decipher if you're reading, when you read uh, American date format that, oh, okay, they mean the 30th of March when it's written as 0330. But now sometimes, oh, it can be confusing when it's uh, past that uh, date. So we need to ensure that data quality is maintained and it's not a simple process, but it can be done. And also when you're storing your dates, are you using a date format or a long date format, or are you just storing the date and not the time? With data transformation or documents and content, here we're looking at how and where are we getting our data? So this is referred to the as unstructured data. How do we get this unstructured data from the different formats into our database in a clean manner. Data from your social media, from your website, from spreadsheets will not come in the same format. Sometimes you either get it as a spreadsheet or it will come as a flat file like your, a notepad. And how do you then clean that up so that when it's time to get it analyzed, you are having almost like one single form of truth and you still don't have to worry about is it right? Have I lost out on any information? And then we have data integration. 
So there do come times where you need to be looking at combining information or databases so that you can get a unified view. And I remember in, 20, in 2006, when I started my journey uh, with Microsoft, where we were implementation consultants. So we were working on Microsoft CRM projects, what they call Dynamics CRM. And then it was Dynamics Exapta, which is the ERP system. When we started on those back then, they were separate systems. And over the years, if you are knowledgeable of the Microsoft Dynamics uh, product set, they have now combined them. And that has provided far better value and faster decision making. But you can decide if, let's say, you start off on the CRM side of things, when do you want to switch on the ERP or the financial module so you don't have to pay for the modules that you are not using? And that is very helpful because you are able to see your customer from various angles. I was working on a project for a car manufacturer as well, and they used to provide services to their clients. So vehicle maintenance, they had a Microsoft Dynamics, we, and then they also had Great Plains. So when we came in on the project, the frustration of the salespeople was that I do not know which clients are buying the most. I have no sight as to what are they buying. So how do I then upsell new products to my existing customers? So when we came on site, we then integrated Microsoft Dynamics CRM as well as Dynamics Great Plains. It was a one-way integration where data from the Dynamics uh, Great Plains system came into CRM. Thus, the salespeople were able to see, oh, okay, Ndombi has bought three 16-inch tires. What else can I sell them? Perhaps for Women's Day, we can give her a free service, or we can ask her to come in for a cleanup of the car. So having that integrated information is very vital. And what is scary is that even in 2020, there are still large organizations that do not have this unified view. There are still CEOs or CIOs who need their IT people to run reports for them because data is in various systems. That is time consuming and is not productive in the least. So we need to start working towards how do we integrate our data better. But of course, before you integrate, make sure that the data is clean because a CRM system, perhaps such as Salesforce and an ERP system might not work uh, capture data in the same way. And then we come to data warehousing or business intelligence, which many of you have heard about. This is how we then process this information. How do we manipulate it to get the insights that we need? And how do we, from this intelligence or this data, how do we then create or make those informed decisions? So how do I know my supplier performances? If I have a supplier who is not performing, why am I keeping them on the database? But if I have no way of tracking them, then I will always have a bad supplier. How do I then look at my sales history as to which customers are buying the most and what are they buying? So business intelligence, as it says, provides you with that intelligence or that data to make intelligent decisions. And the data warehouses allows you to manipulate your information and look at it from different areas and not just a 2D, for lack of a better word, view. And data governance. This is who has ownership of what. It's quite easy that when information is stored and something goes wrong, information is missing, that we are pointing fingers. So when we implement data governance, it's about who owns what data. Yes, IT needs to be a supporting function, but when it comes to financial data, we cannot expect the IT function to tell your finance team how the data should look like. Finance needs to drive that process. 
the sales team, they know what they're looking for when they need to go and meet with their clients and report. So they need to be in charge of that data. IT will be there as a partner to say, this is what we can do to help to make sure that you get your data as soon as possible. Same goes for procurement and with supplier data. What is also important and especially prevalent with technology increasing, we're going more online, is data security. We need to make sure that our policies cover data security at a very deep um, manner. We cannot leave it as a by the way type of process. It actually needs to be the one at the beginning as to we have customer data, we have supplier data. How do we ensure that we have we do not experience any data breach? How do we ensure that as we're transmitting this data, it is not intercepted? And what sources are most likely to allow people to come in and take data? And sometimes we tend to look at it from an external point of view, but actually, even your employees can breach. Someone can get your access card or your password and then have access to human capital data like employee data and then you find someone knows, oh, I know they're earning so much and they're actually not doing that much. Why are they earning that much? So you don't want issues like that. So you need to be looking at access control, your data backups, your data masking and your encryption all those and there's still many more ways that we can prevent data from being hacked and i know some of us have experienced phishing when you're going on online shopping so that's another scary thing that is becoming more and more prevalent with the rise of e-commerce and that's why whether you're a small business and you're now moving on to online sales especially now with COVID, data security needs to be a good conversation. And those that are thinking of going into e-commerce or are already embarking on the journey, take it up with your service provider and ask them, what data security measures do you have in place? Because you do not want to get hacked and your custom information is leaked and then you can be sued for that. And there's different acts that are protecting customers and some of them are your GDRP as well as your poppy here in South Africa. So I know you're feeling overwhelmed, like you want to burst. So we'll take a breather and say, Whew, what have we learned about data management? And then get to the fun stuff. How do we make money? How does all that information from data management help me make my money? But we need to, before we go ahead, we need to understand, lay the foundation right. Once you lay the foundation and take the time to implement your data management framework, so do the security checks. Who is in charge of which data in your governance? How is my data stored in your SQL database or even in an Excel spreadsheet if you do not have the funds to get a database system? But if you're in marketing, there's systems such as HubSpot, there's uh, Microsoft Dynamics for CRM data. There's different information or databases that you can use, even Trello that you can use for storing information. So you need to do a thorough analysis with regards to the systems and the data management framework and understand what is it that I want to achieve when I'm storing this supplier information. Why do I need it? Why is it important? When I'm storing customer information, what do I want to derive out of it? How is that going to help me make money? So we have discussed on the structured and the unstructured data as to this data comes in from various sources. We extract it, we transform it, and then it gets imported into your database. Most people or who are familiar with this concept is called your ETL, another jargon or acronym in the tech space. So how do we go about that process of making sure that we're getting our data in from valid sources? 
and into our database so that we can start taking those actionable insights. So data management affects various areas in industry, whether it's marketing, it's healthcare, it's mining, it's in the entertainment industry. Now with COVID, you might not be making money of um, physical, uh, for lack of a better word, physical events or face-to-face -face events. Now, how do you then go on to online? And can you get more projects from that information or rather from hosting virtual events? Food and beverage, before in South Africa, before we got to lockdown, we weren't selling alcohol and that was really stressful for many people. But how did it affect those in the food and beverage industries? The restaurants were closed globally. So people now in the restaurant industry now need to see, okay, how do I move forward? Which products might not sell? Perhaps if you were selling coffee and delivering it, it might not be the thing to do anymore. Or how do you partner up? Politics, what's happening around the world? How do we change policies with uh, data? How many people are dying from hunger? How many people, unfortunately, are getting shot by police? What does that mean for us? How do we use that data to change the future? In education, why are we still providing textbooks? Let us go online and see and start measuring in the impact of having online learning with students instead of the traditional way of having textbooks, some are getting lost, some do not get to where they need to be due to corruption. And how do we also use data, for example, with regards to AI in education? Some students do not understand English or English is not their first language. And now you have to teach them about photosynthesis or even microbiology or even mechatronics. How do you do that just by them reading? But with data in virtual reality, in artificial intelligence, they're able to see how or the model of it in their textbook, or they can log into a virtual room and then see what photosynthesis is all about. In your business, how are you using your data? Have you thought about the data? I mean, if you take a step back and think, am I making good use of my data? What are your sales right now? Are you, have they decreased? And if they have decreased, which service or product is not giving you the money that it used to, which is 80, which service or product for end of your now with logistics, how are you going to change that with regards to COVID? Is that still a portion of your business that can thrive? How do you supplement that in another way? And it also affects your production, which products need to be let go which products can be improved upon. So now we're getting to data monetization. We want to hear, what do they say these kids these days? Make it rain. How do we make it rain using data? How do we ensure that the systems that we implement going forward bring us money in the bag? Yes, we want to deliver quality services. We want to make sure that our clients are happy. But at the end of the day, we are in business to make a difference and make money. And we have put in so much investment in database solutions, in bringing up teams, in the strategy. So we might as well make sure that we are using it for what it's supposed to be used for and become proactive. So, here on your screen, there's two ladies. One, Cheryl Sandberg and Ms. Lucia Molefe. Who needs data more? 
some of you might be thinking perhaps it's Cheryl because she's managing Facebook, has so many decisions to be made. She's, there's data centers that Facebook is building and she has more than 20,000 full-time employees. This was the data from the 20, 30th of March, 2020. And then we have Os Lucia, who runs a bakery. She also does catering. Why would she need data? So if we look at Mohalaka Creations, we'll see that she, uh, they have a website and we look, we'll look more in depth with regards to how they are using the data and how that has helped them propel to the next level. So as I said, she provides cakes, she does confectionaries and cake, catering for corporates. So she wanted to find out how do I make best use of my data? How do I get an online presence? How do I get more customers? How do I get customers who, who are in a certain income bracket, LSM eight to nine, and also more corporate clients? She's been around since 2006. And in as much as she's had a digital presence, she didn't have digital activity, i.e. the accounts on social media were open, but not much action was happening there. So these were some of her clients that she had, Leticia, who's a single mom on earning about $25,000 or $1,500. And then she had some clients on the high end that were earning around $100,000 or $6,000 US dollars. And fancy, they, for them, price was not an option. Once in a while, then she would have her corporate clients based on word of mouth, but she didn't want to start or she didn't want to only rely on the word of mouth. She wanted to make sure that she is now being more proactive with regards to how do I make sure that I'm getting more over the corporate clients as well as the clients in the higher LSM. So with regards to data management, she didn't have a much of a data architect and she was still using paper. All her customer information or a majority of it was on paper. And these were clients from 2006. No data modeling. There was data inconsistencies. There was duplicates. No data was to speak of and only one source of information. And the data there was being handled by her and her daughter. So through the journey, what she started to do in order to get to start using her data effectively and making decisions and being able to get more customers, she then uh, went on a journey of collecting the data. Some of it was scraped from her website. Some was received from Facebook via Facebook analytics. And the data was then cleaned up. There was, it was stored. It was analyzed and measured and monitored to see what information are we getting, what, which customers are still with us that we need to provide more services to. And then there was data after that analysis was done or monitoring was done, the data was then reused so that she could now get more customers because it's all a repeat cycle as to get that data, clean it up, store it in a good system and analyze and see what are you getting right now and what actions can you take? Do you, for her, was it, I need to, how do I start selling more catering? Which clients here can I connect with who are in the corporate space that I'm looking to get into? And then with that, she then used MailChimp as a database and a marketing tool for her to be able to market to her clients. It was a database that allowed her to also store that information, no longer paper, it was no longer manual. She was using her Facebook more and getting insights with regards to which customers are actually inquiring, which customers are buying that are coming from my online platforms and how do and which products are they responding to with regards to what I'm advertising? Is it the cakes? Is it the cupcakes? Is it the birthday cakes or the wedding cakes? And that allowed her to start 
changing the service offering that she was providing prior to her going on this digital marketing exercise. So within, or rather on the first year, she was able to increase her digital activity and presence and acquire more high-end clients based on the data that she had and the processes that she went up because the this process of data life cycle it's not a once off process or when you don't see returns then you stop doing it you need to keep repeating and making changes this is the same thing that a corporate such as disney interactive does yes they've got big data and they're able to make changes far more quicker but it's the same process that you look at the data what is it telling you okay i need to change this product or I need to add more to this product. How can I leverage off my partnerships? And that for the first year, it nothing happened for the first six months and it was quite frustrating. And you might also feel frustrated when you're changing certain things and nothing is happening. But only from the eighth month, later on in the ninth month, was she able to see people now engaging more and inquiring. Earlier on, people were just liking and sharing, but no money was coming in. And it was, she was getting frustrated with her digital marketing team saying, why are you, am I not getting anything? I have paid you. But now it's an education that needs to happen that you've never been on social media in the magnitude that you are now. So it takes a lot of time to educate your clients, just like it will happen in a corporate space that IT wants to provide a new solution or rather business wants to roll out a new strategy. IT says, let us help you roll it out it won't change overnight, no matter how beneficial it is. So part of the digital or rather the data management journey is about how do you educate your clients and be patient with them. So with regards to the use of data and the insights that you're getting from the data life cycle and the data management, for her, uh, Lucia at Mohalaka Creations. She's now going to start looking more at e-commerce. It, it, it was something she was looking at, but was not too sure of. So now because of COVID, it kind of has accelerated that. But even without COVID, she was looking at, I need to start going online because some of my customers cannot come to me and uh, or rather go to the bank and deposit money. How do I make that process much more seamless? And she will be integrating a chatbot on her website so that she doesn't have to be the one always answering the client queries. Only those that she deems as higher LSM or rather the gold clients will she be looking at engaging with them much more. And then there's the implementation or rather she's adding sugar-free chocolate cakes to her menu because now with the data that she has received she has seen that and also the insights and research many people are saying we want the sugar-free desserts we want to live a healthier lifestyle and now with COVID, she's partnered up with another service provider so that's on the strategic side because she couldn't go out in terms of delivering so now with us at being at level three in south africa the strategic partnership she's working with a delivery company to help her get her products to the clients because they can no longer be coming onto her premises and getting her cakes so one of the things that we need to look back at on this data management or transformation journey is the security the ai and the bias yes data is good it helps us take actionable insights. It helps us to change our services. It helps us work much faster. But what about the bias? And it's a topic that I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of it. because There's two sides and each side is feeling that, you know what, my point or is more valid. How do we ensure that the data that we get or the algorithms that are done do not discriminate against a gender, against a race, against age. So that is some of the things on your data management journey and your 
monetization journey, you need to be looking at who are you discriminating against? You might not be aware of it. And as you're now getting into marketing and sending out information, newsletters, are you infringing on someone's privacy? How did you get that data? When you scrape information, yes, on your website it's fine, but you cannot go scrape your potential customers' website to find out more about them or even uh, competitors' data. That is illegal. So there's certain things that on this journey, as good as, as good, good as it is, we need to be looking at and saying, how do I make the necessary changes? The future, it's not far off. And that's why I said, what does the now future look like with regards to data management and data? Definitely, we are looking at faster innovation cycles. We're doing A-B testing much faster. We don't need to worry up until or wait up until a long time to take those decisions. There's process optimization via robotic process automation or intelligent automation. So those boring tasks that you are stuck doing, you can actually ask your boss, can I get the bot to do it? And then you get to do the more exciting work. Yes, there's work such as auditing of these processes that still need to be done by a human. And robotic aut process automation is by no way going to be replacing a human, not in the near future or even in the long term. We can coexist with the bots and they have their place just like the human is required in the workplace. And then with self-service analytics, this refers to how do you get the information that you need, especially if you're in a decision-making role, you don't have access to these systems. How do you get access to the dashboards and the reports that you need without having to rely on your IT staff? So that is a big win for many customers and business um, heads or heads of divisions that they want to have more power with regards to the data that they need to access. And then we're looking at increased real-time decision-making. I don't want to wait until tomorrow to get today's data. As I'm making sales right now, I need to see which customer has bought what and why did they buy it so that I can see what else can I sell to them. I need to see which product is sitting on my shelf and is not moving. Has it not been moving for three days or is it two days? I need to change that. And also, which employee is not working? People are clocking in and clocking out, but they have not done anything. I know there's some companies who are linking their biometric systems to their SAP systems or payroll solutions. So if you are bringing in a timesheet for eight hours, but you've only clocked in four hours, that is not having integrity. And many people have been fired for that. We're then looking at natural language processing. I'm so sorry. I have to interrupt. It, uh, we're over time. Um, okay. We have a few questions. Um, I'm going to send them or, uh, to you over email. So maybe you can provide some answers and we can follow up with all attendees on an email tomorrow where you can also find the recording. I don't know if you have your contact information that you want to share yes. uh, and we can wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to all attendees. We will be answering all your questions um, and we will send the answers to those questions over email. You will receive the recording to this webinar uh, tomorrow. I'm so sorry that I had to cut it short, uh, but we're running out of time and I would like to thank Nwana for your time and your amazing knowledge. Uh, an experience that you've been sharing this morning and afternoon and for everybody who's everywhere in the world. Thank you so much. And please stay tuned to more uh, transmission of the We Connect Academy. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you to everyone. And I'm sorry I took so long. And okay. I look forward to the next one. And definitely I will be answering your questions. And Andrea will send out the slides for anyone who is interested in us helping them on their data journey. Let's do a quick check to see what improvements you can make. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Andrea. Bye, everyone.